कल इंस्टाग्राम एल्गोरिदम बदलेगा और खत्म मतलब पकोड़े बेचने पड़ेंगे based on my current existential crisis where every week i sit and talk about some feelings i've been having about life and art and everything in between and today joining me on my quest for getting in touch with my feelings is one of the smartest people you'll ever meet and the funniest rohan joshi in the house Hello, 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 hello. I like how you said current existential crisis, like separating it from all the other previous and to come existential crises. Which um, honestly, any time anybody comes on this podcast, I always ask them, "Who was your last cup?" Because it's not like you just have one, right? So of when course, was your of course. Last Several. Uh, my last existential crisis, I think, was two days ago. <laughs> yeah, I think literally two days ago. I'm not even saying that figuratively. I'm using the word literally correctly. It was literally two days ago. Uh, I I feel ya. I feel ya. One of the things I I watched a lot of your interviews, and you are always the funny guy, obviously, and I understand because same me. But does that put the pressure on you to be to have your funny on at all times? I think that's something that uh, one does much earlier in their career, where they feel like comedian means everything has to be funny. If someone takes a photo of you for the press, photo ka pose has to be funny. If someone does like an interview with you, instead of giving a straight answer, you have to give the funny answer. Um, you have to do all of that. But I slowly sort of unlearned that and trained myself now to be like, you know what? I'm going to try just answering the question for a change and seeing how that works out. Um, so now I feel like I'm trying to go to that place where if organically there's a joke, I'll do it. Uh, but otherwise, if I have an answer, I'll do it. But sometimes I've also realized I can sound very boring when I do that. So it's always this battle between the two. Um, do I want to be memorable and completely nonsensical, or do I want to be very sensible and completely unmemorable? Um, and I can see the pros and cons to both. Okay, so how this is going to go? Literally, we're just going to vibe for a while. Uh, yes. There's some stuff that I'll be thinking about, and I'm very curious about where you're at about those things. Okay, super. And then we'll see how this goes. So first up, Rohan, how are you feeling? How is mind, body, and heart? uh mind body and heart let's take those three one by one um because um never have those three been in perfect sync uh, <laughs> so i can't give a simple answer for um mind is okay mind's a little restless uh, mostly because uh, my sleep cycle's been a little bit all over the place um body is actually uh, decent in the sense that i've been treating it better than i usually do over the last year uh but at the same time the last month has actually been very bad like my workout routine and all has not been good uh because i've had to be uh traveling for work etc all of that and um heart is uh, same yeah cold and dead inside like you know matlab uska to chalta hi rehta hai no i'm kidding heart's actually heart's actually all right um it it's been through uh, some emotions in the last couple of months but overall i have to say um on the personal front in a very good and contented space uh on the professional front still longing for things um that this sort of year through out of order but uh getting there one step at a time that is nice overall i think like good good scenes are happening how are you feeling tell me about your mind body and heart everybody is <laughs> like how are you priyam no one's like how's your heart body and mind priyam so okay my heart is i don't know if i out of the three shockingly i think my body is actually doing the best because Fantastic. i have discovered working out like last year and it's been i'm 100% happier for it i Super. hate doing it but i also love it like it's a weird i the the analogy i use for working out is it's like scoring drugs in a very dangerous situation like i hate the act of doing it like i could get shot while doing it but the high at the end is 100% worth it yeah, it's um fun. yeah it's what heart is okay mind i feel like has been a little up and down because of some stuff that happened but yeah overall i think But more good than bad, and that unfortunately is best case scenario. So yeah, yeah, yeah. On balance, we'll take it. <laughs> we'll take it. Okay, so Rohan, you entered our lives through social media, and you're 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 one of the like the one of the original internet boys, so to speak. Mm-hmm. How is your relationship with social media today, and has that changed um, in the last 
couple of years not the decade in the last couple of years yes i think my relationship with social media has changed tremendously because there was a point in my life where i felt like i felt the need to put every single thought or emotion onto social media whether it was in the form of a joke or a deep thought or my opinion on something um and just this sort of feeling that um my opinion was essential to the conversation yeah. um and uh, my being there raised the standard of the place um, and all of that uh but i think i realized what was happening as a result of that is that i was attaching all my self worth to then how those thoughts and emotions and tweets and posts and all of that did um and i realized that the entire emotional graph of my day was dictated by social media um i could be having the best day work wise career wise etc all of that but one troll will say something and suddenly full day is ruined or you know i'll have put my heart and soul into a piece of work and like 20 people will say it's good but one person will say it's bad and then you know the whole day or the whole week is spent in a spiral because of that so i very consciously over the last couple of years um pushed myself to um also i have to again like like sort of preface this by saying that i've reached a point in my career where i have the privilege to do this a bit to pull back a bit right because there are some people who have no choice but to constantly stay one step ahead of the algorithm every single day um i'm very fortunate that i have a little leeway so i have sort of used that time to yeah i spend less time on social media um i physically check social media assets less i post to social media assets less um i have days where like if you see right now i don't think i have any stories or posts like new in the last 36 hours um so i've trained myself to be like you know what it's okay if the algorithm forgets me i'll only post or like put a story when i feel like i have something to put instead of again like when reels came out this whole thing started up aaj kaun sa reel dale um and i'm like eh, you know what um i don't i don't know that that's necessarily my forte so forget it like in the sense that i'll post when i feel like it i won't post when i feel like it i'll be more present sort of in the moment um so yeah i would not say it's a perfect relationship still i still have days where it can absolutely destroy me um but overall i've learned now to put a little distance between myself and social media I agree with what you're saying that if somebody in your position may have the privilege to not sort of like it's it's not your only job so to speak, yeah. but it is weirdly a part of your job, right? Like hundred percent, yeah. So then, how do you kind of maneuver that? Are you treating now social media like your workplace only, or it's yeah? Still- some days, no. Some days I do that, like in the sense that it is still very much. Um, so if I if I did have to treat it as a workplace, I treat it very much as like not a job that I'm at, but like at this. sort of company that i founded um, right <laughs> at the end of the day that's what like if you wanted to call the mojo rojo identity a thing um it's not a job that i joined it's a it's a company that i sort of created so in that sense um yes there is still very much a personal attachment to it right like in the sense that um i think and and i'm not saying this in like a sort of braggy way or whatever but um it beyond a point sometimes doesn't matter how much money a brand project offers if it's not a brand that i vibe with or if it's not something that i feel like would sit right on my instagram channel i say no um and so on and so forth i try and if i'm ever doing like an interview stream with somebody or whatever i try and keep that as honest to the this thing as possible as opposed to just you know pesali i interview kiya um all of those things but at the same time i have learned the other side of it as well which is that um i've learned to have a slight monday to friday mindset about it Mm-hmm. where there is a point at which you leave the office and the work doesn't come with you and then you actually focus on doing other things or like sort of being another person more present um in your space so that's something that i'm slowly training myself to do as well where i'm like you know what today i'm not going to look at this i don't have anything to post no thought is coming or nothing i'm not just going to sit there endlessly refreshing and wondering and you know be like you know man no followers today no comments today no this thing i'm like theek hai yaar jab acha post hota hai to the engagement bounces back and people can tell i think when you're posting for the sake of posting now and i hate it i feel like even for me the last couple of years especially me it's it's just become like how mindless it is i'm like correct, why right? correct why is it taking so much of my time and energy i hate it yeah and then essentially what we do is we are falling into the same trap that um the sort of movies and shows that we hated as kids fell into right which are looking at it being like ye bas abhi banane ke liye bana rahe like kuch logic nahi hai kuch nahi hai pichla hit tha isliye ye bhi bana rahe so you don't want to be the mini version of that also yeah, yeah, beyond the point so um yeah i it, it's my my relationship with social media is evolving um i'm i'm hoping to get it to a point where within the next 5 to 10 years um i can entirely divorce it um 
that's the hope that's and it. i say that with no disrespect to all the people who have followed and have followed the content along etc whatever but i say divorce in the sense that i want to just get to a stage where anything i'm posting is purely because i want to yeah. and not because i feel a need a professional need or requirement to yeah. um yeah i agree i would also like to go back to using instagram like i used to like a journal where it did remember not remember when this was fun remember yeah. when this was fun I feel yeah, I feel yeah. Okay, so Royal, when your special came out a few years ago, which I loved, by the way. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and तब से लेकर अभी तक any time there is an opportunity to quote one joke that you made, I do it. But I'm like, अरे Royal रोशिका का joke नहीं सुना तुमने. That basically growing up, you see lots of weddings, and then you see a lot of marriages. Is why yes, yes. <laughs> he feels that marriage yes. is not for him, uh, which I'm completely on board with. This is a two part question. One sure. that your special has been it's been some years now. Has it been some years? Yeah, 2019. Actually, 2020 January is when it dropped. It dropped January January last year. But you know what? Let's let's face it. 2020 feels like three years past. So exactly. we can say it was a few years ago now. <laughs> last year, uh, has in another your... life, in another <laughs> life. <laughs> has your stand on marriage changed or evolved in any way? And the second part is: Is your stand on marriage still something that uh, brings out a reaction between friends or family? So to answer the first part of the question is: um, Is my stand on marriage the same? Uh, in a way, yes. In that, my problem with marriage is that it's an odd concept that at some point a couple of hundred years ago we just started to romanticize. All yeah. right, uh, like this is going to sound horrible, but let's face it. Um, today we look at marriage as this big romantic union between two people where they solemnize their love for each other for this life and seven other lives and all of that. Uh, but the uncomfortable truth of the fact is that marriage started as a way of brokering alliances. Yes. The origins of marriage are the origins of marriage are despotic, patriarchal, and horrible. All right, and at some point there was this perfect storm of um, essentially marketing capitalism and the commodification of romance um, that suddenly um, worked to create this image that um, marriage is the only thing that validates a life. Yeah. Um, which is that if you didn't hit that goal in some way, your life is invalid because you didn't hit. a sort of key check post and then people started putting that pressure on themselves and so here's where i am with marriage now do i believe that it is objectively 100% evil no of course not um but do i believe that it's a thing that people should have to check off in their lives no i feel like we look at marriage like it's life insurance when we should be looking at it like it's hula hooping in the sense that if you like hula hooping great for you please spend the rest of your life doing it but if you don't you shouldn't have to it's a hobby or it's a thing that sort of if you feel passionate about you do but right now we treat it like life insurance we're like are there pass nahi hai tu chut ya like which is a bit like but i don't think that's it and i think it comes down to the fact that i think that there's some people have the sort of personality and the need in their lives where um they like the idea of a partner sort of completing them and having um that journey and i think there's other people that sort of get that same sense of fulfillment and validation from other sources and i think the mistake we've made is is that we've all we've diminished those other sources in comparison to marriage by saying that the happiness that you feel from those sources is in some way less valid and um less saying and i think that's my stand on marriage is that you can't you can't use it as a tool of stigma Yeah. which is basically what society uses it not there's the people who do it and then there's the wrong people <laughs> the bad well, broken mean, the fabric the, yeah, of society the fabric of society right um so that's 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 my stand um on marriage so what was the second part of your question and is there is there a point of view from friends or family still about it or are they now on board no see that's the amazing thing right and this is this is this is the amazing thing about also sort of waiting it out until you get to your late 30s is that a lot of now friends and family who are earlier like shaadi kar le yaar shaadi kar le yaar they've been through bad marriages <laughs> not all of them but enough of them now have sort of seen the reality and the complexity of marriage to sort of come back to you also with the same nuance of it where they're like you know it's good that you haven't if you're not sure about it yeah. because having now done it i know for a fact that this is something that you have to have a 100% certainty on um to be able to do because it's kind of like joining the army or becoming a doctor or this thing where it's something that takes 
a ton of focus and will yeah. to be able to pull off and that in a way is actually very heartening to see where there's those friends and families who are like look if at some point you genuinely decide in your heart that you want to do it do it but if you don't then also you know what it fine don't because it's a lot better than getting into a marriage you're not ready for and it's um and i think one of the things we don't give ourselves enough credit is that um when you're growing up when you're seeing things when you're becoming aware of things um whatever idea you're sold of marriage um we all have friends and relatives and families and people that we know who are whose marriages are living walking horror stories right <laughs> yes there are plenty who's are not but i'm saying there are plenty who's are and we are always told to never look in that direction to just yeah. look towards that mandap and how beautiful and everything will be um and i just think it's time we started giving credit to that other side also it started like very open eyedly looking at be like ha lekin matlab sabko pata hai ke matlab mamu mami ke bahut peete the like ah oh, and i think kisi ne kuch bola nahi hai and a lot of like we have these grandparents who are like you guys don't understand yeah. what it is like to struggle and suffer together or whatever and i'm like no you know what i'm actually glad that people today don't have to yeah. because today you are really just romanticizing a horrible compromise from 20 years ago you forgotten how horrible you felt back then and now because you have to have something to show for that struggle you have to say things like yeah but see we stuck it out and so we yeah, are morally because, like, better you know, than you yeah because for the you. first two decades like you just stuck it out because you did know better you were all married when you were children yeah. and like, you had children you had children of your own and you look back you're like chalo ab 30 saal se aate nikal chuke hain ab uh, ab kaise bed ke question kare also by that point also because of and this is because of disadvantages obviously that our previous generations had right that by that point you also probably one partner at least lived in a world where they had no way to separate from the other partner you're completely yeah. dependent right on the other partner today that's not the case yeah. so today when you say oh divorce rates are rising etc whatever yeah of course somebody has to stick around and take your shit like right? but you know like this friend of mine and I we were having this very heated like god like can you believe people are still getting married like come on and then you know like that's what i told him and i was like you know but the thing is changes like these happen sort of slowly and over time Of course, it would be ideal if our generation decided just not to, if that's what they chose. But yeah. how our generation, I think, is now stepping out of bad marriages if they're not. Hundred percent, which, which is, is a very, very important step. step. Huge yeah. step, very, very yeah. big step. I agree with you. And then I think, and hope, I mean, and hopefully or not, but basically, like you said, hopefully, a few years down the line, marriage is just something that yes, if you want to do, you have our full support. But if you don't want to do it, it's a non-conversation. Like I would be different. way more. I would be way more pro-marriage if we lived in a culture that normalized getting out of bad ones. Mm-hmm. Like I really would be. I'd be way more pro-marriage if we lived in a culture. I'd be like, then do do it. If like it's easy for you to backpedal out of it in a bad situation, then hundred percent do it. Right now, the reason I'm so sure. suspicious of this thing is because they're con. You're thirty-seven now. Thirty-eight. Eight. Are you weird about aging at all? No. Great. Not When- at all. I've enjoyed aging tremendously. I am a significantly more secure, calm person now than I was in my twenties. Okay, I have a follow-up question in a second. Uh, were you feeling some sort of way when you were turning thirty, though? Like I understand right now you must be. Yes, I'm thirty-eight and right. sexy and rocking, and now you're a, a full-fledged adult man. But when you were turning thirty, did that have you feel any sort of way? I want to say yes because I feel like it's supposed to be a milestone year, etc. Um, all of that. But also, I turned thirty. Wait, I'm thirty eight now in twenty twenty one. So I turned thirty in twenty thirteen. Um, and in twenty thirteen, honestly, I was way too busy with everything that was happening to even sit and take stock. And in a way, actually, I felt really good about turning thirty because, like, comedy was picking up. Um, AIB was starting to become a thing. Um, I was really starting to enjoy just being on stage and things like that. And what's important to remember is that. we forget with the way stand up is in india right now is that in 2010 it basically didn't exist yeah yeah right so for me it was very surreal to enter my 30s in a place where i'm like man 27 ki umar pe bhi pata nahi tha ki ye hone wala hai theek hai like 27 pe bhi pata nahi tha ki ye hone wala hai aur ab 30 pe sab ho raha hai <laughs> so in a way it was actually a very nice feeling sort of stepping into like my 30s with a feeling of hey i'm on a new journey as opposed to i feel like some people carry into their 30s that feeling of ab to bas job hai aur ab to bas ye hai aur ab to bas step 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 karna hai um so i actually i was like hey you know what this is this is good this is good i have i have money in my uh, bank account for the first time in my life um i can buy drinks um like at expensive bars 
um i can travel well um i can do all of those things i'm actually i'm quite looking forward to this 30 thing that is very interesting i'm turning 30 this year and i congratulations I would, and i love aging like i'm actively looking forward to being an old woman but i know that i'm feeling some sort of way about turning 30 and i don't know what it is but it just feels like am i do i feel 30 like how am i supposed to feel when i turn 30 like it's a lot of that i think you're saying that now but the one thing i can attest to is that this oh am i feeling 30 am i not feeling 30 there's going to be a point where one day i'm not going to know when <laughs> not going to know how but you're going to wake up one morning after a night of partying and you're going to sit up and there's going to be this moment where you're just going to be like yeah i'm 30 oh man yeah at some point like it was i don't know when it happened i don't even know it happened exactly at 30 but some point between 30 and 35 there was a switch that just flipped i'm not kidding it was literally like almost overnight somebody turned something off where it would have been like acha saath ye garbom pe da na tu aaj tu do beer pe ke dekh like aaj tu do beer pe ke dekh i started drinking alcohol actually very early and very irresponsibly so i am already Like same same my body already rejects alcohol ah, same 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 it. basically that's what happened my body was just like dekh tu 15 saal bahut aish kiya ab tu chill mat about that ha ab tu thoda okay follow up question that i wanted to ask about you being so comfortable now uh, as a 38 year old do you sometimes fear using the word fear loosely but now that gesture se bade ho rahe ho aapke traumas resolve ho rahe hai empathetic tum zyada ban rahe ho you know you you have a better understanding of yourself and all do you sometimes think you will not be as funny anymore Hundred percent. Comfort is the enemy, always. <laughs> oh my God. Comfort is the enemy, always. But you know what? There's a part of me that's like, on the one hand, I'll be like, I was really hoping you of... tell me that three of not at all. You're born oh, funny. Sorry. You will be funny no, no, forever. No, no, no. no, that's not true. That's not true at all. I think what happens is actually more than you will not feel funny. I think um, what feels funny to me now is different. That perspective sort of a changes what you find funny, and it also changes what emotions you want to. So, like for example, I've always like. I love doing comedy. I love being a comedian. But I've always wanted to like my dream before I ever knew I wanted to be a comedian. I want to be a writer um of like say shows or movies or books or whatever. And the idea there was to always engage with as many emotions as possible. So more than like actually yeah, I want to qualify that. I don't think I just I feel like oh I will not be funny. Mm-hmm. But I do feel like I will not only focus on that because I feel like there's this whole emotional basket to be explored and you will just naturally grow into that quote and quote brand yeah in the sense that i think that's just something that's happened to me naturally like there was a time where i would look at something happening and my first thought would be like what's hilarious about this uh now a lot of time look at the situation and instead of what's hilarious about it the same question is what's ironic about this what's depressing about this what says so much about the world that we live in about this what's heartbreaking about this what's infuriating about this what's um and then sometimes that um situation or that event actually unlocks itself to you way more as a writer because mm-hmm. you're suddenly looking at it from so many different perspectives um so i'm looking forward to that um the real fear though is comfort like the, the older you get the more comfortable you get the less you feel like why am i putting so much effort into proving myself to random people matlab uh, you know like i'm good i'm comfortable i have food on my table i have my bills are paid my cats are safe um I have some future investment. This thing. Why am I? Why? Why am I fighting with sixteen-year-old Devyendu from Bandup? Like, who is called my video cringe? Like, yeah. What? What is this serving me? Like, interesting. I was because I was just like you know now. Like, look at me. Like, I don't sleep with the wrong people anymore. I'm not broke anymore. I don't have an alcohol problem. My relationship with my parents is fixed. I do fucking yeah. yoga now. Like, I'm yeah, yeah, shit. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you got. It's a lot harder to do comedy when you feel like you have less to complain about. Like, yeah. So I feel like the basis of comedy is in ranting, and um, yeah, like I ranting you sucks like, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible, man. Like it's really, really bad. It's not good for comedy at all. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, and and the thing you're saying about like your like yeah, my relationship with like my mom now versus my relationship with her in twenty is so different now. Like it's just so strange to just engage with her adult to adult now. Mm. Like there was this point in like my early thirties where like at some point I have to stop engaging with her, like her fifteen year old child, and I have to talk to her as an adult would talk to another adult. I have to on certain things stand my ground in a way that an adult would with another adult. 
if i have debates and arguments with her it can't now just be about okay because mummy said so or because the son acted okay i need to now be able to have these conversations on their merits um with her and that's made a huge difference even in the way she opens up to me like i feel yeah. like i now know her better as a person because she now trusts me enough as an adult to be like wait you know i can now drop some of my baggage on you with a lot of nuance and trust that you'll understand it um so that's also been fun i think what happened especially in indian households uh, which did not happen with me which i used to hate growing up i i think i did not give my parents enough credit for how well they brought me up in a way that how genuinely cool they were and i think so many of my friends as as they as we reached our 20s and all really struggled with seeing their parents like sort of drop from the pedestal they had put them on yep. even mere ghar pe it was very ki bro hame bhi kuch nahi pata we are also figuring it out only super and i was always treated like an adult which i used to hate existing boy got to be ignored the bar part of like other parents but now i have huge respect for that oh 100% like it like the social development that you sort of get from that yeah. is like crazy okay so you are all comedian who followed his passion followed his heart and you're the success story now that it worked out do you sometimes feel that that is, because i think I, i get asked this sometimes that it's romanticized this passion ko profession bana lo jo mujhe lagta hai ki bilkul agar tum kar sakte ho karna chahiye but how when i started writing professionally uh it i'm not saying i hate it now or anything but it became a job it became something course, that was of course deadline related and you know like on some days also hard and you know it's not just doing this like on the side all of those things same i was assuming happens with comedy where once it becomes a job it's a full fledged job yeah. so how are you on this advice of if you love what you do you will never have to work a day no that's not true you'll have to work you'll have to work if you love what you do you'll have to work because see at the end of the day there's a the thing that you love doing mm. and then once it becomes work there's all the things that get added on top of it right it's one thing um for me in 2010 to wake up and be like i want to go to an open mic and try these 3 minutes about this thing and that's it because that in itself was the end goal yeah the end goal was just the trying the 3 minutes because i thought it would be a laugh yeah. versus I now need to go try three minutes and make those three minutes into a really good six minutes because that then has to become a part of my special on which there is a certain amount of pressure because there is already a body of work which is at a certain level of quality. So now this has to, at the very least, be at that level of quality or above. Um, plus, somebody is paying me to do this, so I have to make sure that I deliver so that I continue to get paid for doing this. Um, and also at the same time, I have now tied in the fact that I have a life insurance premium payment and a mutual fund payment and all of that to this. Um, and once you do all of that at the end of the day whether you're doing your passion whether you're doing that whatever um you will become and this i this sounds like a very dramatic sentence but i don't mean it that way you see we all become slaves to our lifestyle right yeah. like at the end of the day so you can follow your passion you can choose to do all of that you can be like me mai bas mera artistic integrity maintain karunga um you can do all of that and um but you may not then get the ac that you were growing up with you may not be able to get the nice car that you grew up with you may not then you have to accept that trade off or you accept the fact that what you really like is also all that other stuff and that's fine i feel like a lot of people will go with materialism so no don't underestimate the fucking happiness that a nice big tv and good ac room can give you all right let's let's not forget those things and the importance of that and having good food on your like plate like seven days a week etc all of that if you get used to that and if you want to do that then beyond a point you have to be willing to even if you're continuing to indulge your passion then you have to be willing to look at it professionally mm. but you have to be able to be willing to look at it as the thing that how does this then support this lifestyle that i love so much um and then the other option is if it doesn't then i think it's completely okay for like i have a tremendous amount of respect for people who are also like no this job is my job and this job is what allows me to go party around the world um for this thing because in my life that's actually a priority i don't care about what i do monday to friday but at the same time i don't hate what i do monday to friday because i know that what i do monday to friday allows me to go ham saturday sunday um because also again follow your passion turn your passion into your profession etc whatever uh bahut 1% of sentiment hai. um for a lot of people are just going to be like garden me dalo passion garden me dalo profession mere teen bacche hai um hum ek chote ghar mein rehte hai hamari ek scooter hai um मुझे इस सिचुएशन से निकलना है और उस सिचुएशन से निकलने के लिए मुझे जो भी जॉब करना पड़े मैं करूंगा क्योंकि वो इंपॉर्टेंट नहीं है सिचुएशन से निकलना इंपॉर्टेंट है बिल्कुल एंड आई थिंक अनदर जस्ट टू ऐड टू दिस पैशन थिंग सो लास्ट ईयर लास्ट ईयर आई डिड सम स्टैंड अप व्हिच आई हैड लॉट्स ऑफ
yes. I was first runner up. I was I was such a big Congratulations. That's yeah. really good as you should as you absolutely should. But so this was my first time doing it and I realized that oh I actually might be kind of good at it because I had never done it before and everywhere else the thing came that now though you must now you know you have a stand up career that you have to pursue and I would come back home and I'm just like you know it's fun and it's great but to pursue this passion I don't yeah. know if I'm feeling this passionate about it and I feel to. a little guilty kind of you know sort of admitting it to myself or even to the others that I'm like अरे पर ये तो ये हुआ तो बहुत मजे आ रहे हैं घर जाने का If at all there was a doubt, I also spent. This is this is the first. I don't have too many comedian friends like that. This is the first I was spending lots of time with tech comedians and just struggle story by struggle story. I was like, this is. I can't. I can't. No, no, it's hard. It's hard, especially now. Like I actually have a lot of respect and empathy for anyone who started out in the last sort of three to four years. Yeah. I mean I have respect and empathy for every comic but for people who have like started in this landscape and then they have had a lot of great stepping stones right like for example we didn't have comic stands and this and that and all of that but at the same time just the sheer number of people doing it um just the sheer number of sort of different platforms you have to be active on um to be noticed um the amount of grinding you have to do between open mics etc all of that add to that in the last year just this what the pandemic has done yeah. Yeah. to that sort of live experience entirely um it's work like there are days where like you said right the struggle per struggle per struggle i listen to some of these stories and i'm just like yeah I'm so glad this happened in 2011 and like they were just 12 of us so glad Like this is the first time in my life I understood the meaning of the phrase first mover advantage. Oh, like God. this is a textbook example of first mover advantage. Like that's it. Rohan, are you somebody who can separate the art from the artist? And if it is dependent on some things, then what is that dependent on? I think I'm learning to be somebody who can separate the art from the artist because um, at the end of the day. See, also depends on the kind of art, right? Like there are certain kinds of art that are like hugely collaborative, um, right? And if there's one or two artists who are involved in that, say for example, that you have a problem with, um, does that necessarily devalue the art? Because I feel like it is possible. I feel like it is possible to separate the two. You take somebody like uh, Louis C.K. also, right? Like we know he did sort of horrible things, but I don't know how to go back and change the fact that. the work that he done before that when i watched it it some of that writing revolutionized my thinking right and that doesn't in any way exonerate excuse this thing ck but i have to learn to sort of look at that other art piece separately because how do i change the fact that i have and have and continue to have a viscerally emotional response to those works of art um and at the end of the day i do believe that you don't live in a vacuum right you have to still consume things you have to be moved by things you have to um all of those things so i try to at least in things that are like retroactive um so i try to make that you don't that, have control on like you said right yeah you don't have so i try to i try to sort of make that separation um wherever i can if it is possible in some way to legitimately enjoy that art without mm. sort of whitewashing or legitimizing what that artist does mm. um in their personal life then i try and make that separation so i think woody allen is actually a perfect example of it right where it's like look i can't change the responses i've had to all the woody allen work i've already seen yeah, yeah. but if woody allen makes a new movie would i watch it no probably not mm. you know because i feel like in doing that i am actively if i buy a ticket to that or if i this that i am legitimizing his sort of right to continue to do this yeah yeah um versus what's already happened like and i think as humans it also comes down to let's be honest man how it comes down to how much we like the artist right like today for me the gold standard example of this is always michael jackson 
I have heard the same people. Well, like, oh, you know, what he did to those kids, etc. This, that, whatever. Man, party me, one bar beat it, but that way, look, like immediately, right? Because it's there, it's ingrained from your childhood, etc. All of that, you've had too many emotional responses to it. I feel like for me, the art separation happens fairly easily. Sometimes a little more dependent on the crime. Like, of course, yeah. like Harvey, it just seems so much more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there's a very big difference between, like, like for example, let's face it, right? None of us would be having this conversation if Harvey Weinstein had been accused of tax fraud. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, exactly. Like, oh, I'm never watching a Mera Max movie again. Exactly. Right. Okay. I have not asked this to anybody else, but I feel like you might have a point of view on this. Does data breach scare you, and does it affect how you surf the internet? Of course, data breaches are terrifying, right? Because it's it's absurd. You don't know how those little discrete points of information can be weaponized against you. Um, and I feel like what happens with data breaches is it changes the context of those spaces. It turns safe spaces into unsafe ones, but it's doing that without giving the people who are reading that data breach any context of what the conversation leading up to that was. So then, now knowing everything you know, is there is there a change in behavior or pattern of how you speak to people online, even like in private spaces, like you were saying? I mean, yeah, there is. Like, I mean, there is a certain change in it in the sense that you one now acts like. they are aware that anything can be breached at any point in time and i don't just mean that like and i'm not just talking about like conversations or this or that like i still very much have my safe spaces um and places where i have with my closest friends extremely honest conversations where um we work through stuff together uh but like yeah one does start about things like you know just password security and you know who you even do things like open your phone around and yeah. who and like just care about your data and what websites you sign up to and this and that and and i think that's important and then i'm not even getting into the dimension of um the way your data can be used against you in terms of how voter lists are used in this country and have historically been used as sort of ways to start pogroms and riots and specifically target communities and um carve up areas and deny people access to care and things like that i guess what i'm trying to say is sleep well kids <laughs> good advice good advice okay so on a slightly lighter note maybe not the plot like that's quite serious this is not okay. data breach okay, okay. like heavy i think the number one thing that you and i have in common is our unadulterated love and obsessive fixation with our homes and staying at home it's best Best. Talk to me through it. Your experience of how was it always the case? If not, when it changed, and just like the joy of it, just like talk dirty to me, Rohan. Let's. I do have it. always loved being at home. Always, oh. I have loved it always. But this whole idea of, see, I didn't. You know, growing up, you live with your parents. You do this. You do all of that. Um, I didn't ever think I would get to have such total control over a space in my life. where i would be able to select it down from the tiles and the wires to the last paint finish and piece of furnishing in it right um and i always knew like as somebody who loves being at home um i always had a strong sense of what functions i wanted my home to carry out right like i always knew that it's extremely important to me that i have space for lots of books i have this i have all of that um but i didn't know how much i would enjoy the aesthetic part of putting that together and watching it sort of come together element by element that is not a thing i knew that i enjoyed until i actually got into the process and then i went holy shit tiles are a universe holy shit bath fittings are a galaxy holy shit um this thing is like a rainforest and this thing is like this and there's just so many options and choices and my favorite thing of course is uh, what i like to call the ass test for the couch um i believe it's the single most important thing if you're ever <laughs> this is the one piece of home decor advice i can give 100% is never buy a couch online never buy a couch online your ass has to sit on a couch before you decide whether it's a good couch or not and this is the other very important piece of advice i will give you when you go couch shopping you always take at least one other person with you okay. when you go look at couches and you take that one other person with you when you sit on a couch and you like it here's very fundamental i'm going to do an act out for you Is Shad here? Two ways. There's two ways you can sit on a couch. All right. You can sometimes come and you just sort of sit down and yeah. you're like couch. And then there's another time where you come and you sit down. And this is very important. There's a ah. The getting into it. There's a ah. That's an emotion. All right. That ah is an emotion. So one is when you sit on a couch, did you get that emotion? And two is the person who's with you. 
you invite them to sit on the couch and you watch their face as they sit down because believe me a person's face says a lot when they sit in a comfortable couch and that's why the ass test is important because there are certain couches that are like come here let me hug your ass and that's the couch you want it was and also just beautiful to see it come together because i i don't know if you've had this experience but there's this point at the early part of the renovation where you come in and like everything's broken and wires are hanging and pipes are and you're just like what the fuck have i done you're just like yeah i have bitten have way I more than i can chew this is ye nahi hone wala hai ye nahi hone wala hai mere se nahi hone wala hai and then 6 months later you walk into this place and there's just this sense of holy shit this has been designed to my specifications Absolutely. Absolutely. and this is my little citadel of joy um and it's great and just the fact that it got done um just before the pandemic um i think the same way for me like last year through the pandemic i was living alone also and everybody was super concerned about like are you okay mental health ghar pe hi hai akeli hai and i'm like but you don't understand i'm great I've never been better. I never. I didn't know how to explain this to people. I didn't know how to explain this to people. Were like, "Hey, how you doing? You've been alone at home for so long." And I'm like, "I know. I know. Have you guys heard of Netflix? It's amazing." See, when I was just like, "I'm the same way that you're saying that I feel like my house just optimized for my experience." Yes, one hundred percent. I think now over over the years, I've also trained people that if they have to see me. they have to come to my house mai kahi nahi aati but yeah what happened because part of who you are i'm like in initially they used to make fun yeah, of yeah 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 like you got to become such an old woman and i'm like yes same same It's the true. only literally the only context in which i had to stop saying this thing is like you know, obviously you can't like on a first date be like come to my house mm-hmm. like this thing that's the only context is like yeah let's go out and hang otherwise all friends it's always like listen my first option will always be You know what I'm going to suggest. <laughs> If anybody has any objections or reservations, we can talk about it and then figure it out. Living by self and living in the house, I deal. Rohan, what is your relationship with money now that you have some? I'm assuming. And um, a few years ago, when perhaps you didn't have as much. So my relationship with money has improved um, over the last few years um, as I. it's improved in both ways in the sense that i've gotten better at saving it investing it um, planning for my future with it but it's also gotten better in the sense that i've learned to not feel guilty about spending money on things that i genuinely enjoy see when you grow up in bombay you know you learn certain things like for example mereko nahi chahiye lamborghini ki kahan chalaoge ha ha nahi chahiye nahi chahiye nahi 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 chahiye hi nahi uska matlab tension chahiye hi nahi mereko lamborghini like i'm not that but I love having a big TV. I love it's a thing that I love doing. I'm a pop culture obsessy. I love the idea of setting that system up in such a way that it's basically the theater experience but in my house. Yeah. Right? Because that's a thing that matters to me. I don't really drink much. I don't really this thing I spend my money on things like if I want to travel and see a place, I'll do it. Um if I I mean even my traveling things like man i would stay in a hostel happily when i was like 19 or 20 but matlab abhi uncle ko khud ka bathroom chahiye luxury luxury khud ka bathroom chahiye khud ka bathroom chahiye nahi share karenge kisi ke sath nahi hoga nahi hoga like sorry bahut kaam kiya maine life mein ab mera chehra do teen baar newspaper mein aa chuka hai khud ka bathroom to chahiye theek hai basic demands basic demands allowed hai abhi i am very aware of the fact that i've lived a life where i've never known the want of money right hmm. have i have i have i absolutely been in positions where i couldn't afford that drink or couldn't afford to go on that holiday or couldn't 100% but i've always had food on my table i've always had basic needs taken care of there never been a day in my life where it's like i don't know where my next meal is coming from or i don't know where my next rent is coming from or i don't know next this that whatever um so i guess i'm also learning to respect it in the sense that um just have a little more respect for how tenuous it is also that अभी सब मस्त है लेकिन कल इंस्टाग्राम एल्गोरिदम बदलेगा और खत्म मतलब पकोड़े बेचने पड़ेंगे लाइक वी ऑल बिन देयर यू नो दिस व्हाट इज योर मोस्ट टॉक्सिक ट्रेट एंड व्हाट इज योर बेस्ट ट्रेट दे डोंट हैव टू बी रिलेटेड श्योर एंड आई एम श्योर देयर आर मेनी बट टेल मी वन ईच व्हाट इज माय मोस्ट टॉक्सिक ट्रेट माय मोस्ट टॉक्सिक ट्रेट इज दैट आई एम नॉट ग्रेट एट एक्सप्रेसिंग एंगर दैट्स वन and my second most toxic trait is um i'm very scared of trying things 
like in the sense that like i'm like like even if it's like an open mic or this or that or whatever i'm very scared to go try a bit i feel like it needs to be at a certain degree of quality before i even open mic it which is actually a very backward way of looking at it that way. is that what you're saying but you know for a perfectionist but it goes the other way in the sense that where because i tell myself i'm a perfectionist and because i'm not sure i have a perfect product it's better to not try which is so strange coming from you i feel like i would never think that about you i know but i do it a lot like in the sense it's like ha mere ko show likhne ka hai lekin ye jo idea hai na 100% perfect wali feel nahi aa rahi hai to likhunga hi as opposed to where it's it's a combination of like sort of fear of disappointing one's self and sort of now having been part of like the validation and likes economy for so long that like the fear of being like disliked for something that i do sometimes creeps in one trait about me that is good is that um if i'm in the right mood or if i'm required to um i am good at talking to people um so that's a trait and the and another trait that i have that and this is again a weird sort of silver lining to anxiety is um i'm very good at gaming scenarios and sort of figuring out in the sense that asking devil's advocate questions <laughs> like i'm very good at asking devil's advocate questions because i look at a scenario the result of anxiety 50 questions already pop out um so i'm good at interrogating ideas that is a useful trait for sure it's and about you being you being somebody who's easy to talk to the first time i ever met you i don't know if you remember uh and i don't think i had to i had a precon i mean i don't know i didn't think that this is what you would be right. but maybe i did because i was very actually surprised how easy and chilled out you were with everyone like we were i think some three four people had to shoot with you and there was maybe some 20 people on the floor and you were yeah. just such a like just in and out like it was not a big deal we went to the chat you came down you had water the office boys were very excited to see you like you know and you were just so comfortable through the whole thing and i don't know what i was expecting for you to be but i don't think it was that yeah i believe that whenever you're interacting with somebody whenever you're doing this that whatever um you have to remember that they have had as long and complicated a day as you have um you are here to do your job they are also there to do their job they are also like in the sense that they there may be a certain hierarchy on set or on floor etc whatever but none of that excuses you from not treating the other people like normal human beings right today i found that this is extremely important that you have to give everybody a certain degree of dignity because i think the worst mistake i've seen people make in the 10 to 11 years that i've been here is just after having a few good years or reaching a certain place thinking that that just gives them the right to talk to anyone anyhow like in the sense and i don't think that's fair um because the thing is i've been a writer right i've been like a behind the scenes script writer i have been the lowest rung <laughs> i have been the lowest rung i have interacted and i have had interactions of both kinds with people where i've had interactions with people where i'm like but you're the biggest star in the world how are you so cool yeah and i've had interaction with other people where i'm just like I think you think you're cooler than you are and you should know that when your career dies I am going to dance on its grave. Also what am I going to get out of being like an asshole to people or stand offish to people? Like if we have to today be on set together for 9 hours and I come in an hour one only and I'm stand offish to you yeah. I've made the next 8 hours fuck all for both of us. And but some people do it and you know like I feel like even with my experience of working with so many celebrities it's just like the what a weird thing to say but the smaller the celebrity the weirder they are about their stardom or whatever it's true it's yeah. true it's actually very very true because like literally some of the biggest bollywood stars i've met don't give a shit don't because give a they're shit they're so Just, secure yeah. in their size that they know that they don't have to come on set and sort of swing their dick around at people for people to recognize that this is a good person to be working with forget big or not big right where just the idea that hey this is a good collaboration Also, I just like interacting with people, like in the sense that you're good at it. You're good at it. Like, why would I? I don't understand why my first interaction with somebody would be negative. Like, I don't. That's just not a way that I'm built. Let's all have a good time. We'll all finish work quicker. Yeah. We'll all also see. We forget, you know, that we're in an industry where this might not be the only time we work together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. This is not going to be the only time we work together, and I know for a. fact and i can say this for a fucking fact that i know and i can think back to at least two or three jobs that i've gotten in my life today whether they even like small 
little influencer gigs or this or that or whatever where i know they could have gone with a bigger and more talented person than me and like a funnier better this that everything and i know that i've gotten the job just because they like but this person will be more pleasant to work with on yeah this. hard relating hard relating right like and i know this for a fucking fact yeah. and it's just and i wish just more people understood that yeah like the way you build collaborative relationships and get people to sort of want to work with you more and more again is if you build like it was extremely important for me that like when we shot wake and bake i knew that it was going to be a stressful day and my simple logic is that stress hai to cake hona chahiye <laughs> i have very simple fundas in life ki aaj agar din mein stress hai to din mein chocolate bhi hona chahiye so i had basically pre ordered fucking two giant chocolate cakes that would arrive in the middle of the day before shoot so there was a point where half the day is like okay guys we're all going to take a 20 minute coffee break we are all going to eat fucking cake nice we're going to just enjoy for 20 minutes and then we're going to jump back into it but let's all just fucking take our stress down for 5 minutes by eating some chocolate cake so much better work happens in that by it's true it's true you're already looking forward to all the great things you're going to achieve yeah okay i have come to the last question of this this is super vague i ask this to everybody and i've got some very interesting answers and no pressure and be deep but What do you think, Rohan Joshi, is the meaning slash purpose of life? The purpose of life, I guess, is to just move forward, like in the sense that it is, it is to just move onwards, right? Like what we've seen so far is time and life they just march on, they march on, and they march on. And I just feel like um, I don't necessarily believe it's everybody's job to create value in this universe. I don't necessarily believe it's all of those things. Your life can be. you finding one mountain that you really love and want to look at for the rest of your life and that's the meaning of your life then that there was a certain amount of beauty in the universe and it was your job to just sit there and behold it and sort of look at that mountain and be like you know what i appreciate you like and that's enough and that's enough meaning and purpose and then somebody else's life coming meaning and purpose can be i fucking discovered the polio vaccine It is so different just, for everyone, and cannot be compared. I don't believe that there is a meaning, and I don't believe that there is a purpose, um, because I feel like there's a certain amount of arrogance that comes with believing that in a universe this massive, you are in some way an essential commodity. Um, but at the same time, I don't mean to go in the opposite cynical direction and say that you're not worth anything. Yeah. I just think that that worth is something that can be self-ascribed um, based on. what your wants and needs and the things that make you happy are yeah like you're not the center of the universe but you're the center of your universe whatever that may be yeah you're the center of your if you're the sort of person that wants to build a fortune 500 company and change the world good on you that's incredible but if you're the sort of person that wants to spend their life just sort of going on treks and taking photographs of birds and all of those things then also good on you Okay, good on you, Rohan. That's all I have for you. I had such a great time getting in touch with my feelings. I hope you did too. I and did. This was a very fun way to spend a Sunday morning. Yeah, and I'm glad I got to spend it with you. And again, I already knew this was going to be great. And one of the reasons I wanted to get you on because whatever little I know of you, most of it like on digital and whatever few times we met. Uh, I just knew. I just always know that every time I watch anything you have done, I go back with something. I'm glad. Of. I'm glad. That I'm, makes I'm really great. glad to hear that. That is the meaning and purpose of my life. Right? Yeah, but you've achieved it. Okay, Amazing. friend. I'll speak to you soon and take care. I will take care.